This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 66, for broadcast on the 17th of June, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Mars probe Maven back in service following a major glitch, unraveling the mysteries of brown dwarves, and three new crew members board China's space station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome. To Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Maven spacecraft is finally back in operation after defaulting into an emergency safety mode in February. Mission managers eventually traced the problem to its inertial measurement units, which are responsible for navigation. Technicians were able to bypass the problem by developing a new program, allowing the spacecraft to operate using stellar navigation. MAVEN's principal investigator, Shannon Curry from the University of California, Berkeley, says the fix should allow the orbiter to continue studying the Martian atmosphere and acting as a telecommunications relay satellite right through until the end of this decade. NASA's MAVEN, or Mars Atmosphere Volatile Evolution mission, was launched back in November 2013 and entered into orbit around the Red Planet in September 2014. Its primary mission is to explore the planet's upper atmosphere, its ionosphere, and interactions with the sun and the solar wind to explore the loss of Martian atmosphere to space. Understanding atmospheric loss gives scientists an insight into the history of Mars' atmosphere and climate, liquid water, and planetary habitability. Mission managers lost contact with the spacecraft on February the 22nd after it performed a routine scheduled power cycle of IMU-1, which is used to determine the spacecraft's altitude in space by measuring its rate of rotation. MAVEN has two identical IMUs aboard. Once contact was re-established, telemetry showed the spacecraft was unable to determine its altitude from either IMU. In response, MAVEN performed a computer reboot, but still couldn't determine its orientation. And that triggered the activation of a backup computer, which allowed MAVEN to get accurate readings from IMU2. It then switched into a pre-programmed safe mode, where it ceased all planned activities, including both scientific and relay operations. In this state, it awaited further instructions from mission managers. Now, luckily, earlier issues with the IMU-1 and the fact that the IMU-2 was already nearing the end of its lifespan had resulted in mission managers developing a new stellar navigation program for MAVEN, which they were planning to upload anyway in October this year. The failure forced the spacecraft's team at Lockheed Martin to accelerate their work on the new software and upload the code as soon as possible. The new patch was ready and uploaded in mid-April. And following a series of tests, the new stellar mode was successfully activated, allowing MAVEN to return to normal operations. This is space time. Still to come, unraveling the mystery of brown dwarves and three new crew members board China's space station. All that and more still to come on space time. Astronomers have discovered five brown dwarves, objects which fill the gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars. The five, reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, will provide new clues about how these rare objects are formed and evolved. While some brown dwarves may have been born as such, others are thought to start their lives as spectrotype M red dwarf stars, which lose enough mass during their evolution to cease core nuclear fusion, the process which makes stars shine. That turns them from red dwarfs into brown dwarfs. Current estimates suggest that brown dwarfs fit into a category between the largest planets, which have about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectrotype M red dwarf stars which are about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or to put that another way, about 0.08 solar masses. However, 
Astronomers still don't know exactly where the mass limits of brown dwarfs lie, limits which allow them to be distinguished from low-mass stars, especially since their composition is often very similar to that of low-mass stars. Like Jupiter and other gas giants, stars are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium. But unlike gas giants, stars are so massive and their gravitational force is so strong that hydrogen atoms in their core fuses into helium, releasing huge amounts of energy and light. Brown dwarfs, on the other hand, are not massive enough to fuse hydrogen in their core. Therefore, they can't produce the enormous amounts of energy and light that we see in stars. Instead, brown dwarfs fuse relatively small stores of a heavier atomic version of hydrogen called deuterium. The study's lead author, Nolan Greaves from the University of Geneva, says these limits may vary depending on the chemical composition of the brown dwarf or the way it formed or its initial radius. To get a better idea of exactly what these mysterious objects are, astronomers need to study them in detail. That means getting as many examples as possible. But it turns out brown dwarves are actually quite rare. Despite all their efforts, so far astronomers have actually only characterised around 30 brown dwarves. Now that compares to billions of stars and thousands of planets. The five newly discovered brown dwarves were identified by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite, TESS. These so-called TESS objects of interest have been catalogued as TOI-148, TOI-587, TOI-681, TOI-746, and TOI-1213. Each of these brown dwarves orbits a host star, with periods ranging between 5 and 27 Earth days. They have radii between 0.81 and 1.66 times that of Jupiter, and are between 77 and 98 times more massive. And this places them right on the borderline between brown dwarves and red dwarf stars. These five new objects, therefore, contain valuable information. Each new discovery reveals additional clues about the nature of brown dwarves, and it provides science with a better understanding of how they form and why they're so rare. One of the clues which scientists have found to show up in these objects is the relationship between their size and their age. Brown dwarves are supposed to shrink over time as they burn up their deuterium reserves and cool down. But the authors found that the two oldest objects, TOI-148 and TOI-746, are so close to their limit that they really could easily be very low-mass stars. And the authors are still unsure whether they really are brown dwarves. Brown dwarves are one of the features in the current issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. With the details, we're joined by the magazine's editor, Jonathan Alley. Today, Stuart, to take a look at these special kind of stars that have been known for a long time as brown dwarfs, there's, there's a sort of a, a long history of calling small stars out there because you've got, you've got super giant stars and you've got giant stars, you've got sort of normal sized stars, and then, then small ones, they've called them dwarfs for a long, long time. And these brown dwarfs, um, they've often been called failed stars because they weren't big enough in terms of mass, which sort of equates to size, but the mass weren't big enough to have enough mass to squash their cores, uh, the middle, middle bits, so tightly that nuclear reactions were called, and, um, and bingo, you've got a, a radiating star. They just weren't massive enough to do that. We now know that there are some reactions that can occur inside and cause a bit of heat, but nothing like a, a real proper star. So they're small and they're not as massive as a, as a normal sort of star, not big enough to radiate lots of light and heat and that sort of thing. But the thing is that astronomers have now found planets out there in space that are around about the same mass as some brown dwarves. And they've also found, found some brown dwarves that are around the same mass as planets, raising the question, how do you tell them apart uh, for these particular categories? So the dividing line between some planets and some stars of this kind has become blurred. And so have the ideas about how they formed and everything. So brown dwarfs, like any other kind of star, have been thought to form within big clouds of gas. That's where you get stars forming. They're called star-forming regions, these big clouds of gas. Planets, though, they're, they're thought to form within the swirling mass of gas and dust that collects around a young star. Um, as, it, as, it has for, as it is forming and, and when it gets formed and, and first gets lit up, if you like. So 
that's the planet's format of this. They call it a disk swirling around. Um, an it's like a planetary disk. disk. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of a planetary accretion disk swirling around a newborn star. So that's what they think that planets are formed, whereas brown dwarf stars are formed actually out of big clouds of gas. Now it looks like um, some planets uh, uh, orbiting far out from their stars may actually have formed like brown dwarfs from within collapsing uh, gas clouds. And meanwhile, um, some free-floating brown dwarfs may have formed like planets, uh, initially within a swirling disk around a star, and then have got flung out of their star system and then to float through space forever on their own. So in the magazine, we take a deep look into these so-called failed stars and the competing hypotheses about how they came about. It's really quite interesting. And I remember, um, must be back in the 80s, I guess, um, brown dwarf stars became... Um, the target of a bit of a hunt, I suppose. The, they'd been proposed, but no one had ever seen one or detected one or found one. And so there was a bit of a, a rush on between astronomers in different parts of the world to be the first to um, you know, absolutely confirm that they'd found a brown dwarf. And I do remember a couple of astronomers here were um, made some claims that they had, so I don't think that really got anywhere. But uh, it wasn't long before with better telescopes and things that they were able to detect it. Now, brown dwarfs, because they aren't proper stars that radiate a lot of intense heat and light, um, are actually hard to spot because they're cool. They're, 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 they're small as things go in space, uh, and they don't give a lot, off a lot of energy. The energy they do give off is um, in the heat part of the uh, spectrum. So what has just been launched, James Webb Space Telescope, yes. which is optimized for looking for in infrared. cool things, yeah, infrared, cool things out there in space, things that give off a bit of heat, but not much. They're very cool. So brown dwarves, I imagine, are going to be popping up left and right once the James Webb Space Telescope starts having a look around. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. Still to come... Three new crew members board China's space station. And later in the science report, scientists develop a living human-like skin for robots. If you think that sounds creepy, wait till you hear how it sweats. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Three Chinese Taikonauts have arrived safely aboard Beijing's new Tiangong space station for what will be a six-month mission to complete construction of the orbiting outpost. The trio blasted off in their Shenzhou 14 capsule aboard a Long March 2F rocket from the Zhaiquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert. They'll replace the Shenzhou 13 crew who returned to Earth in April after 183 days on station. The Tiangong, which means Heavenly Palace, is expected to become fully operational by the end of this year, with two more science modules being added to the main body. Last month, the Long March 7 rocket blasted off from the Wang Chang Satellite Launch Center in Hian Province, carrying the Tianzhu 4 cargo ship loaded with six tons of fuel and supplies, which successfully docked to the space station seven hours later. It's been a busy time for China's space program, with Beijing launching an ever-growing flotilla of spy satellites designed to keep an eye on the communist government's growing list of adversaries as it continues what Beijing says is its build-up for war. In late April, China launched five Xiling-1 Goofang reconnaissance satellites into orbit using a Long March 11 rocket fired from a floating launch platform in the East China Sea. Beijing claims the new spacecraft will be used to provide commercial remote sensing data services for sectors including land resource survey, urban planning and disaster monitoring. In reality, they're spy satellites designed to provide high-level surveillance capabilities. Another pair of Earth observation satellites, the Sawi Going 101 and 102, were launched a few days later aboard a Long March 2C rocket from Zhaiquan. Once again, Beijing claims they're designed to provide commercial remote sensing data services for industries including surveying and mapping, as well as environmental protection, urban security, and digital rural development. Since 2016, 
Beijing has launched more than 188 Earth observation, surveillance or reconnaissance satellites designed to provide near-continuous high-resolution and electronic monitoring of areas of interest to China. The last month has also seen Beijing launch a new atmospheric environmental monitoring satellite that was flown aboard a Long March 4C rocket from the Tian Satellite Launch Center in northern China's Shaanxi province. The spacecraft is equipped with five scientific payloads designed to monitor air pollution, including a new laser-based carbon dioxide detector, as well as instruments to measure aerosols and other particulate matter. Meanwhile, a Long March 2C rocket has successfully placed nine Geely 01 commercial satellites into orbit, launching from Zhai Chang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. This constellation will be used to research and validate a range of technologies, focusing primarily on car connectivity and communication systems such as navigation, mobile phones and interfaces between the car's manufacturer and its onboard black box. A week earlier, China launched a Long March 2C rocket from Zhaiquan, carrying what Beijing describes as three low-orbit communication test satellites. No other details were given. But it's not all been smooth sailing for Beijing over the last month or so. Just two weeks ago, a new Chinese commercial launch vehicle suffered a major failure. Initial reports suggest that the fourth SQX-1 mission had a smooth launch and first stage solid rocket engine burn, but for some reason the second stage solid rocket engine failed to ignite. An investigation into the cause of the incident is now underway. And this is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new Danish study warns there's a rapid decline in Omicron-specific neutralizing antibody levels only a few weeks after the second and third doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Compared to people's antibody responses against Delta, a patient's Omicron-specific antibody response declines rapidly from 76.2% at week 4 to just 53.3% at weeks 8 through to 10 and 18.9% at weeks 12 through to 14. While the third dose boosted this response for at least eight weeks, between weeks 3 and 8, it was still around five times lower than the response to Delta. The new findings reported in the Lancet Medical Journal suggest that additional booster doses may be necessary, especially in older people. However, they add that the vaccines may still protect against hospitalization and death through T-cell immunity. Over 6.3 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first appeared in the area surrounding China's Wuhan Institute of Virology back in September 2019. However, the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be around 15 million, with well over 536 million confirmed cases globally. A new study says a plant-based diet, especially a healthy one, can reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The findings, reported in the journal Diabetologia, analyzed the metabolite profile of blood plasma samples taken from around 10,000 people. This gave an indication of how plant-based their diet is and how many healthy and unhealthy foods they were eating. Researchers say those whose diets were more on the plant-based side, especially when the foods they ate were predominantly healthy, had a lower risk of type 2 diabetes. In not at all creepy news, Japanese scientists have made living human skin for robots and they say it even feels a bit sweaty. The team placed a robotic finger in a solution of collagen and human dermal fibroblasts, the two main components that make up human skin connective tissue. The initial layer of skin shrank naturally to wrap around the finger, and it acted like an undercoat for the next layer of cells to stick to. These were human epidermal keratinocytes. The skin was tough enough to withstand the robot finger circling and stretching. It was waterproof, just like real human skin, and it can even heal itself if a collagen bandage was applied to any wounds. 
The findings reported in the journal Matter suggest this is just the first step towards having robots covered in living human skin. However, the skin was much weaker than natural skin and it required a constant supply of nutrients and waste removal in order to survive. All in all, quite brilliant, but very creepy. A new survey has found that half of all people in the United Kingdom believe in life after death. The findings are based on a survey of a 1,000 people across Britain and show that a quarter base their belief on personal experience, while 28% base it on religious belief. Three in five people who believe in the afterlife think that all people experience the same thing after death. A quarter of participants believe that there is either a heaven or a hell. And 16% believe in some sort of spiritual realm, while another 16% believe in reincarnation. Four out of five people in the UK believe that being a good person gets you to heaven, while 32% say being a good person also means accepting a higher power. 87% believe hell involves psychological and physical suffering. The survey also found that two in five people claimed to have seen or felt the presence of someone who had passed away, while almost a third believe that it's possible to communicate with the dead and one in ten have actively attempted to contact the dead, more than half using a medium. Interestingly, more than half of all pet owners surveyed said they believe pets also go to an afterlife, and 39% believe they'll be reunited with their pets after death, similar to other departed loved ones. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says it all provides a fascinating insight into human thought in the 21st century. This is a survey that was done in the UK by a company that sells ghost hunting gear, which is all the little machines to go pip and that sort of stuff. They looked at a thousand people to find out what their belief was in the afterlife. And they found that 50% of people do believe in an afterlife and that yeah, most of those believe that you know, everyone gets the same thing. Now, they either go to heaven or hell, which is interesting because 55% of those who believe in an afterlife, so 50% believe in an afterlife, so you half the 55% believe they'll go to heaven, but 58% still worry about going to hell. So there's a bit of an overlap there. I don't know how people can believe they'll go to heaven and go to hell, but never mind. Maybe they're they, unsure they about what they've been doing. <laughs> they're having a, a bend each way. The yeah. moral consequences of it all. Yeah. I mean, that's the sort of um, thing you get. Yeah, you know, heaven and hell are, are pretty prevalent amongst the 50% of people who believe in an afterlife. So, And it goes on and on and on, like all, all sorts of things like that. Anyway, 40% believe they've seen a ghost. 35% have actively attempted to contact the dead and 40% believe they'll be reunited with their pets. Oh, I hope I am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're probably bored with me. And, and that raises the issue that, you know, sort of what does the entity look like uh, after death? Is it at the moment of death or is it sort of as they, as you would prefer to see them when there are puppies? It's a bit weird. Of the people who believe in the afterlife and of those who you know, believe they go to heaven about one in ten have seen a psychic, which is one in ten of the 50%, which is one in 20 people have seen a psychic, which might just be a fairground sort of person. You just roll up and say, hello, you know, I see riches in your future, etc. Others have obviously said they tried to contact people themselves, which probably means Ouija boards and things like that, which a lot of the religious community regard as satanic Ouija boards. Most people regard them as a bit of silly fun. But anyway, so there's all these things in the survey, but basically pointing out that there's a fair percentage of people who believe, right, and this is about belief. Belief, don't forget. It's not about, there's no proof that the things they believe in is actually true. So, and people believe in lots of stuff which is uh, not true or maybe true. We may not never know. Um, and so, therefore, that's what the survey says. But anyway, the vast majority of people who say they're going to go to heaven say living a good life and being a good person is enough. But uh, 32% add on that you have to actually believe in the higher power. So, if you don't believe in God, you're not going to go to heaven. But, no matter how good you are. So that's what the people of, of Britain believe, or at least 50% of 1,000 Brits. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. 
Space Times also broadcasts through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeart Radio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Times store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 